Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Power Breakfast, Advancing Canada's Clean Technology Landscape. This virtual session is intended to provide business leaders, thought leaders, and startups with a perspective on the evolving situation and its implications. Today, we're taking a look into the future of clean technology in Canada, with a focus on advancements taking place in Peterborough and the Corthas. We've invited Martin Yule, the Executive Director of Cleantech Commons, as well as innovation cluster client Brandon Robson of Horizon Aircraft to discuss the trends and their contributions to the clean tech society. My name is Michael Skinner. I am the CEO of the Innovation Cluster, and I will be uh, your initial guide as we go through this, uh, this session. I always like to recognize our core funding partners. They're the organizations that really drive our organization. Many of them sit on our board, and they really help make sure that uh, we're able to continue supporting our clients the way we do as well as all of our zone partners, program partners, knowledge partners, and entrepreneurs partners. I mean, if it wasn't for this group of sponsors and partners, uh, we wouldn't be able to deliver the services that we do for our clients today. Next, I'd like to recognize our startup heroes. So we basically have six individuals that work very closely with our 50 plus clients to make sure that they you know, overcome the hurdles that it takes to start up a company, get to a point that they can build up their organizations and then eventually graduate. And, uh, and some of them actually come back as, uh, as knowledge partners and sponsors that we've seen on the previous page. So it's basically a full, full ecosystem. As well as we've got a very dynamic group of volunteer board members. So these are you know, pillars and leaders of our community that, uh, that work tirelessly behind the scenes as volunteers to help our clients you know, work on the strategy of the organization and, and make sure that the innovation cluster continues to evolve and pivot to support our clients and continues to be a, an engine that basically helps create jobs and of course create startups in our in our region. Today we did something a little special. Um, so a number of you uh, will have smoothies that either were delivered or that you uh, picked up uh, the package from Chimp Treats. Chimp Treats is an innovative health food startup company located in Peterborough. And uh, since we weren't able to have breakfast together, we, uh, we thought we would pivot into this and at least deliver something nice to you to, to try out this product and, uh, and to have that uh, product, obviously, while we go through and listen to the two great speakers that we, we have today. So just quickly, uh, what do we do? So we basically, uh, you know, how do we impact Peterborough and the region and uh, our overall region, including the city of Kortha Lakes? Well, basically, we sort of do three things. So we strengthen innovation and entrepreneurship capacity. So our job is to make sure that we're constantly working with innovative entrepreneurs to make sure that we've got mentorship, advisory services, expert advice, workshops. We basically create that ecosystem so that it's easier for those innovative entrepreneurs to really start their, their initial companies. We assist in the formation and growth of those companies. So really working through the process of everything from the starting of a business idea to you know, moving through to potentially getting your first investment, your first product launched, you know, hiring your first employee. And then eventually once you get to sort of five or six employees and you get up around half a million to a million in sales, then we sort of graduate you out of our, out of our system. And of course we grow our knowledge-based economy. So by creating that ecosystem, we're constantly creating a bigger ecosystem around a knowledge and uh, that knowledge-based economy is growing inside of our community. Now, a couple, two things I just wanted to mention before I pass it over to our speakers is, so in the summer, we partnered with uh, Clean Tech Commons to get a Community Economic Development and Diversification Grant. And this is basically to help build the Clean Tech Commons and to help build an accelerator at the Clean Tech Commons. And Martin, you will be talking you know, pretty extensively about that today, but it's a key element that both the Innovation Cluster, Trent University, and the City of Peterborough have come together to basically build the next uh, clean tech research park, which uh, you know, hopefully will drive quite a bit of entrepreneurs that are in clean technology, not just domestically here in, in, you know, in the region as well as in Canada, but also we're hoping to attract them from across the world. And so just recently, I'm, I'm pleased to announce that the innovation cluster has now been designated as the 31st incubator across Canada to run the startup visa. And so what that means is that we can now intake clients through the innovation cluster through a very specific program that will run three times per year. And this program basically will allow those entrepreneurs that are international that are coming to Canada to basically go through, 
build a company locally and, uh, and eventually get a permanent residency as part of it. So it's a fast track for immigration into Canada and it's specifically designed for startup visa or startup uh, organizations and, and newcomers. And the really interesting thing about it is, you know, although we're one of 31, we're the only rural incubator that's, uh, that's been appointed across the country. So it's been a huge uh, long journey for us. I think we started back in 2014 when we started going through the process of applying and uh, we're really happy that our first program will be launching in, in January. And of course, if you want to be a startup client yourself, please go to innovationcluster.ca. There's a, there's a form for both the startup visa, which is coming up in the next few weeks. So in January, of course, plus your regular startup program is there. Always please follow us on social media, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn. And of course, those of you that are following us on social media, you'll see that we launched our 25 days of startups. So those of you that are not following us, please follow us. Basically every single day, we've got a different uh, startup. It's basically a virtual advent calendar and it kind of does a you know, 30 to 45 second video on each of those companies. Usually kind of a preview into what's happening. And uh, the last day we've got a bit of a surprise because we have a little bit of a blooper reel, reel as well, which kind of shows you some of the behind the scenes things, which are of course what people see when you're seeing a company on the outside is sometimes not the, the scrambling that happens behind the scenes. And uh, we've shown a little bit of that as well. And of course, these uh, breakfasts would not be uh, possible without some great support of our community partners. So Peter Ronquorth's economic development is a key partner. And I'm going to just pass it over to Rhonda Keenan for just a second to say a few words. There we go. Good morning. Now I'm unmuted. Um, so thank you, Mike. Um, and good morning, everybody. I, I'm pretty happy to be here and join everyone again um, in, in these power breakfasts. Um, as Mike mentioned, I'm uh, the CEO of Peterborough and the Corth, or Peterborough and the Corth is Economic Development, and we work for the city and the county of Peterborough. And what we do is really make this region to be more competitive and create a better, stronger destination for all businesses to thrive in. And so we want businesses to make sure that they feel supported, they have all of the access to the tools and resources that they need to grow and expand, but more importantly, that we do it better than any other region out there. And so I'm feeling pretty bullish these days, despite the pandemic and, and a really crummy 2020 year that we've had, um, because we have some amazing things that are happening here. And I think the, the services that the innovation cluster is providing, companies like Horizon Aircraft, um, and, and then the really exciting development project at Clean Tech Commons that you're going to hear about, um, I really think that we are starting to set the table to be seen as leaders in, in a region that really does punch above its weight when it comes to building innovation and especially in clean technology. And we hope that that's gonna drive our future. So, so that's why we're happy to, to sponsor events like the, the Power Breakfast. And I hope that you have a great presentation today and enjoy the webinar. Thanks. Thank you, Rhonda. And of course, if it wasn't for Rhonda and her team, uh, I think our community would not be doing nearly as well as, uh, as what's happened through COVID. And more importantly, I think they really understand that uh, we need to come back stronger. And uh, I know Rhonda's team is working very closely with all of the businesses in our community to make sure that that, uh, that, that happens. Next, I get to introduce uh, Brendan Robson from Horizon Aircraft. Horizon Aircraft has been a client of the Innovation Cluster now for a little over I think, two and a half years. Um, very, very exciting client uh, based out of the city of Kortha Lakes region. Basically, they're building the next generation aircraft. And uh, it's interesting because they're based on um, years and years of experience within their team that have built uh, aircrafts and modified aircrafts. But, um, but also, of course, their CEO, uh, Brandon, who's going to talk to you, is also an F-18 uh, fighter pilot. So he's definitely somebody who has no problem taking risk, which is important, obviously, when you're building a company. And so I'm going to turn uh, things over to Brandon to do a little introduction. Hey, thank you, Mike. Uh, really appreciate it. Um, and I'm really thankful for the opportunity to come and speak to everybody this morning. I am going to share my screen real quick and we can get going. Okay, how's it looking? Okay, great, good, it looks good for Mike. Okay, so yeah, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, we're really excited today to uh, talk to you about Horizon Aircraft and a really cool emerging new market in clean tech, uh, that's urban air mobility. Uh, it wouldn't be possible, it wouldn't be here today without the help of Mike uh, Skinner and John Gillis and their leadership at the Innovation Cluster. So a uh, huge shout out to those guys. Also crack team, um, Alana, Kate, Rachel, uh, and Rose, 
just an exceptional uh, group of individuals, amazing initiative, uh, and have been a real bright spot throughout this whole pandemic. Um, and that, you know, the startup visa is an example. There's, you know, five or 10 more examples. Uh, same with Rhonda and, and her initiatives. And uh, Mike spoke very truly. We're very appreciative to have connected with them. Without further ado, hopefully you guys have got uh, your smoothies and your coffee uh, all stoked up. I've got uh, two coffees already downrange. So if I talk a little quick, I'll try to slow myself down. Um, but yeah, pretty stoked. Uh, so what we're going to talk about today, uh, we're going to talk um, about who I am, first of all, and why you need to listen to me or why it would be good to listen to me. We're going to talk about uh, why we're doing what we're doing. So the big problem that exists uh, that we think we found a really good solution for. We're going to talk about uh, what uh, overall is emerging in order to deal with that situation. So the urban air mobility market, and we'll talk about that. And then we're talking about specifically how Horizon Aircraft is going to address that problem. So our unique uh, product that we've been developing for quite a while now with the help of uh, the innovation cluster and some guidance and also some talent uh, that is local. And we're gonna bring it back uh, full circle and talk about uh, where this is all happening. And a uh, little hint, it's happening a little closer than you might think. So who am I and why should you care about what I'm saying? Well, uh, I don't know about the latter, but the former uh, is me and the left-hand side, the happy little kid um, is me and our family aircraft. It's an old flying boat, Republic CB. Um, you know, I had stories from when I was a kid. Uh, you know, I think my first flight was when I was six months old. Uh, my grandfather who was a World War II bomber pilot. Uh, he used to fly me around, uh, you know, ever, ever since I was uh, extremely young. And there's stories of you know, me being three years old and standing on the seat and he refuses to fly the airplane. So he makes me fly the whole thing uh, from point A to point B. It's about a 15 minute trip, but it takes about an hour and a half most of the times. But uh, I think that's kind of ingrained things into me. So on the right hand side, you see the same little kid, uh, but I grew up on the outside um, and convinced everyone to, uh, uh, to let me play with a little bit bigger toys. So that's me and the uh, CF-18 in the background recently hung up, hung up my spurs. Uh, and it's a bit ironic that I'm talking about uh, clean tech because I probably have the single most largest per person um, carbon footprint. And I'm glad, glad to spend the last half of my life kind of cleaned up for that. But uh, a lot of fun, it's been a great ride and uh, we're starting the next journey right now. So the story of uh, Horizon Aircraft is a story, uh, a family story really of innovation, uh, a passion for aviation, uh, and some really uh, excellent engineering, I think, along the way. So it starts with my father uh, on his retirement from uh, Johnson Johnson Pharmaceuticals, where he was uh, started out as an uh, engineer designing machines, all the way up through managing advanced pharmaceutical manufacturing. The entire time, he was an avid aviation enthusiast, and we're lucky enough to have an aircraft at home, uh, the Republic CB that you see in front of us there, flying boat, a beautiful machine. Uh, right there, it's on skis, uh, so we can fly off the lake in front of our house when it's frozen in the wintertime, as well as uh, when it's liquid in the summertime. So it was a pretty fun uh, experience and pretty, pretty privileged to have had that experience. Now, that airplane right there, you see, has over 50 custom modifications. So that's the result of my father's uh, MacGyver-type engineering uh, abilities uh, that persisted his entire life. So when he retired, he had so many people asking him to do those uh, types of modifications to his airplane. Uh, and that one is built by him and uh, my grandfather uh, from scrap metal from scratch uh, that he opened his own business. So Eric B. Robinson Limited that eventually became Horizon Aircraft um, to sell those uh, aircraft, to sell those modifications, sorry. And throughout that, uh, dad has been interested in a lot of things, um, but primarily the electrification. So he saw an opportunity in, uh, in around 2000 to start bringing electric systems on board to replace older, heavier mechanical systems. So electrification of flap and the gear system, um, installation of a really cool Corvette V8 power system. So an, it replaced the entire engine in the aircraft with a Corvette engine, uh, went from about 215 horsepower to about 450 horsepower. So doubling the horsepower in a machine like that definitely uh, doubled the performance, not exactly like an F-18, um, even though I tried to fly it like one um, unsuccessfully. Um, but yeah, so a pretty cool modification there uh, and a lot more fuel efficient, a lot less carbon emissions uh, already. Um, simplification of the control system and whatnot. And I kind of joined the team in around 2015. So in 2015, 
I took a look at that engine and again, the popularity of that system being sold uh, worldwide, uh, that engine conversion system. And I thought there'd be an opportunity to use that as the foundation for a hybrid power system, which eventually became the beating heart of the machine I'm gonna show you later. Um, hybrid power, again, really just attaching a, a really cool electric motor uh, in, in parallel to the conventional gas burning motor. It uh, gives you tons of power uh, overall. And if anything happens to your conventional portion of your engine, you run out of gas, you throw a piston, the electric portion takes over and allows you to fly to safety. So really cool um, idea. And my father agreed. And so uh, the hybrid electric system uh, was born and we incorporated Horizon Aircraft to kind of give direction to that. And all that was playing into what we were identifying as a problem. So in 2015, uh, I was fortunate enough to have my son born, Ethan, uh, and I really started thinking about the world. So again, I'd definitely over-contributed on a per capita basis to the uh, pollution uh, problem, uh, and it's a significant one. So I remember thinking uh, one day when I was flying out of Miramar, so San Diego, uh, Miramar famously where Top Gun was uh, based out of, uh, and we're taking off heading west over the coast uh, to do some dogfighting um, over the beautiful blue ocean. And uh, so you take off in a westerly heading, you basically fly right over that bar where Top Gun was filmed. Uh, it's way smaller than you might think. Um, and uh, you head for Torrey Pines at 2000 feet. By the time you hit Torrey, you're already going uh, about 450 kilometers an hour, uh, pushing 500 kilometers an hour. And I looked north and I remember looking north. So from San Diego, looking north towards uh, LA and there were six lanes uh, going one direction north of, you know, gridlock traffic. And it was one of those days where you could see the smog kind of collecting along the road. Uh, and I thought, man, what a waste. Um, I didn't realize then, but uh, from a statistical perspective, road congestion actually accounts for about 40% of the global transportation uh, pollution. So 750 million metric tons of CO2 equivalent just being belched into the air um, by cars uh, sitting there really doing no useful work uh, and frustrating everybody lowering GDP because you're not going anywhere. Um, so very unproductive. Um, and I didn't realize another statistic was very interesting. In these urbanized areas, sometimes the average speed of those vehicles gets down to you know, 10, 15 miles an hour. Um, coupled with the fact that by 200, 2050, you got 68% of the world's population living in urban areas, uh, according to the UN. So that's adding 2.5 billion more people uh, to cities that are already overcrowded and congested. congested. So I started really thinking about this problem within the context of um, you know, hybrid electric power uh, and some of the really cool technological advances um, that, uh, that help us along the way. And the world was thinking about this problem too. And uh, that gave rise uh, to urban air mobility. So for those of you who don't know what urban air mobility is, I'll simplify it uh, since a quick overview, 30,000 foot uh, view this morning. Uh, and it's still early and you're probably still enjoying your smoothies. Uh, think of it as air taxis, okay? So we have air taxi services now, but they're very expensive helicopters uh, like Blade uh, out of, uh, I think it's LA and uh, out of New York at this time. Um, but the urban air mobility movement seeks to democratize this sort of air um, tra transport, so air taxi. So think of it as a smaller drone that's been blown up to hold people, medical supplies, or cargo. Uh, they operate a lot cheaper and guess what? Uh, they go 500 feet or a thousand feet above that congested road and they can travel in a straight line, mostly electrically powered. So cheaper, more efficient and operationally a lot more effective uh, of moving people around, especially within the context of the last few slides. And so that uh, has been an exploding market uh, currently. So pick your projection, uh, one, 500 billion to $1.5 trillion market by 2035 um, with at least a 20% compound annual growth rate. So lots of motivation and there's some cool designs that are emerging. And here's why. So consider uh, some examples to really cement why this makes sense. So San Francisco to San Jose, you can pick any two points in the world that have similar geography and, and a difficult road system. But this one's particularly uh, prescient, okay? So you have a lot of water, you have bridges that get, uh, that get packed. So if you're traveling from San Francisco to San Jose on a good day, it's gonna take you about an hour 40 to drive. And that's if you don't get stuck in traffic or there's no accidents. Uh, using an air taxi service, 
um, eVTOL, that's a 15 minute drive or 15 minute flight. So 15 minutes versus an hour 40. I don't even have to break out the abacus and do the math on that. Uh, that's going to be a lot less uh, emissions. That's going to be on par or cheaper uh, with, the, with the car version um, and overall a lot more efficient. Uh, and like I said, there's a lot more examples. And interestingly enough, in Canada, if we want to bring it home on the West Coast, Vancouver is very similar. Lots of water, lots of awkward ferry um, movements. And so, uh, you know, we've looked at all sorts of interesting things on the West Coast, not the least of which is uh, hospital, hospital, medical uh, eVTOL delivery of radioactive isotopes, which is uh, something that where speed really matters. So you can triple the amount of medicine that uh, cancer patients get if you do it right with an eVTOL. Uh, aircraft. Uh, and it's also very interesting to developing nations. So as a corollary to what's happening, uh, you imagine uh, some of the developing nations uh, using these air taxi services to leapfrog trillions of dollars in transportation infrastructure. So why build roads when you can build two vertiports um, separated by a couple hundred kilometers? Uh, vertiport basically think, the, think of them as a helipad where these air taxis can take off sometimes autonomously and travel between those two points. Uh, excellent for remote resupply, for disaster relief, uh, for medevac, and also when you're thinking about developing nations, also think about remote uh, communities, okay? So uh, serving the, uh, the northern communities in Canada um, as well. So uh, fantastic, um, you know, side opportunity as well, uh, if not a primary opportunity for the, uh, for the emerging urban air mobility market as well. Okay, so we talked about uh, the problem. We talked about an emerging market. Uh, how is Horizon Aircraft uh, approaching this marketplace? Okay, so the first thing we did is think about, uh, you know, some of the really cool technological advances that have been happening over the last five years. So you look at the trajectory of battery technology as one, and then also electric motor technology. And those have crossed critical thresholds in the last five years that make very unique designs possible. Couple that with our hybrid electric system, and I show you uh, why this is uh, special. But fundamentally, I want to talk about uh, one of the major problems with some of the other designs that we see. Okay, so if you think of a standard air taxi that you know some uh, urban air mobility company is um, is developing now, a lot of them are quadcopter designs. So pick your small drone with four kind of helicopter type systems on the top, and blow that up so that it holds people and cargo. Um, and that's the type of design that you see typically. So like a blown up drone, basically. Now that is uh, good for the takeoff and landing portion. It's very efficient. But anytime you have to actually go anywhere with that, uh, you're carrying that drag around the entire time. So it's kind of backwards. You don't see birds, you know, flying from point A to point B with, uh, you know, four little wings on top of their heads uh, buzzing, uh, you know, around in circles. Um, right, because that, that is quite inefficient. You see birds with nice long wings, uh, very efficient uh, wing-borne lift is kind of the, uh, the most efficient way to fly. So uh, we reverse that equation. So instead of designing a machine, you know, uh, centered around that vertical takeoff and landing portion, we built a machine that can take off and, and land vertically uh, when it has to, no problem, but it returns to a normal aircraft uh, throughout 99% of its mission. And how does it do that? So dramatic pause. And here we go. So uh, through the miracle of distributed electrical propulsion, uh, that hybrid system powers uh, and batteries power uh, an array of lifting fans that are buried in each wing. And this is a patent pending design. We have, we have a few patents at this point, and it's a pretty rich patent landscape, if I'm being quite honest, uh, in both the wings and the canards. So here it is in the vertical takeoff and landing mode. Um, you picture it just about to take off now, you're all buckled in, uh, those, those fans fire up and it, uh, and it lifts off the ground gracefully. And then as soon as it starts to go forward, when it picks up the right amount of speed, those wings will close carefully. And then finally, uh, they're back to their closed position. Okay. And their closed position, uh, that's where it spends 99% of its, um, its life and it acts like a normal airplane. And we'll talk about some advantages of why uh, that is a good thing. Okay, so there it is with the wings open, looking like a million bucks. Um, and when you close the wings up and you act like a normal airplane, instead of going 100 kilometers an hour, like a lot of these other designs, it'll go 350 kilometers an hour. And we verified with some advanced uh, computer simulations 
and we'll verify that in the real world as well. You can carry a lot more. So 500 kilos of load uh, for the prototype and often um, more than that if you're using it as a conventional aircraft and 450 kilometer range. And that's an operational range. So that's a range where you can go from point A to point B, 450 kilometers away. Then uh, you see baby Yoda is meditating on the landing strip or your uh, landing pad and you have to divert to your alternate. So then you can go back to normal uh, overshoot, go back to normal airplane mode. Uh, and hit your alternate 100 kilometers away. It also gives you operational flexibility for bad weather, for increased winds, uh, maybe flying around a thunderstorm. Um, and if anything should happen to any of those fans, you pick a normal uh, runway and you land. Um, and, that's, uh, and that's a pretty nice contingency to have. Mentioned the patent pending wind design, uh, wing design, and it's all made possible because of that hybrid electric power system and the miracle of uh, modern batteries and electric motors. You can carry five people, so one uh, pilot and four passengers, and that uh, confirms to the Uber Elevate specifications uh, and broader specifications that are coming out. Um, and again, designed for practical use. I'm from an operational fighter pilot background, um, and we're not overselling it. This is this is uh, vi these are actually very conservative numbers, and I could uh, probably bump those up, um, but we're not about that. It is the first modern fan and wing design in a long time. So NASA tried this in the 50s and did very good uh, work, but they didn't have, um, you know, the, the type of technology that we have and that, that has crossed the threshold, like I said, in the last five years. So as it's, uh, as it's life, 99% of its mission as a normal aircraft, um, you get a lot of benefits. So when we go to certify this aircraft, for example, um, you know, the, which there's a lot of certification frameworks that are emerging now from some of the major certification bodies. Uh, so when we certified for commercial flight, you know, fundamentally, this is a normal airplane with just a more advanced safety system when you think about it. So if you could take off uh, normally, get the wings closed up, and now you have a problem where you have to slow down. And once you get to a certain uh, speed, the airplane automatically recognizes that, opens up the wings, and now you have an airplane that's not gonna stall or crash. And you pick a nice field and you can land vertically and uh, call the repair guy and away you go. Um, the certification agencies talk about 10 to the minus nine failure means one in a billion chances of a critical failure happening. And with the number of fans and the systems that we have on board, uh, we're easily going to um, meet that. And we talked about the operational capability uh, being paramount to this whole thing as well, which we're uh, pretty happy about. More eye candy, really. This is, uh, this is just to show you uh, really a, a, a really nice picture of it, but also uh, the seat is left empty on purpose. So I come from uh, a background that you know, dealt with a lot of sensors uh, and it's, uh, it's been my intention all along to make provisions uh, for advanced LIDAR, advanced infrared. And so this machine will be set up for autonomous operations right from the get-go. We'll keep it light and we'll keep those systems out and have a layered approach to that. So the initial aircraft will be piloted uh, for test purposes, but uh, rest assured um, that is uh, increasingly an intelligent thing to do. And, and so that is uh, being accounted for with this aircraft. And there she is all opened up. So this is another um, nice visual for you in the morning in case my voice is already drowned out into a monotone. You can take a look and just enjoy the visual show. So uh, really just to show you, it's, 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 it's more designed than you might think. It's not just a pretty kind of picture and a rendering. Uh, so we have a mechanism for the canopy opening for the pilot, which is separated from the passengers, which is important from an air taxi perspective by that barrier that you see there. So the canopy slides forward, the pilot can ingress. Uh, naturally, there's a little step that lowers. Uh, also, I mean, you can notice some other interesting things. Um, the wing uh, inhibits when it's open, the, the door from opening. And so that's so no one can get out with the wings open and stick their head into a fan or jump up and try to put their um, hand into a moving fan. I see someone had a question in the chat. Okay, sorry, I'll just leave that for now. Um, and so, like I said, highly engineered at this point uh, and not to spoil it, but uh, we're gonna have uh, a smaller version of it flying fairly shortly. So I told you I'd bring it back to uh, uh, right back home and uh, where is all this happening? So the last kind of uh, thing I'm gonna talk about and we are very proud to be local. So we're based out of Lindsay. Uh, we've had a lot of support, like I said, from the innovation cluster in Peterborough, city of the Quarth Lakes, Rhonda Keenan as well. Uh, and we're looking to expand uh, in that direction. 
This is in a fantastic area to do this kind of work in. Uh, it is just close enough to Toronto to attract some really excellent um, talent. And if anything, over this last year has proved is that, uh, you know, remote, we're, we're able to get quite a bit done remotely as well. So working with folks all around North America. Um, but at the same time, it's away from prying eyes and we can maintain our, you know, undercover kind of status, uh, test, do all sorts of complicated testing uh, in relatively clean airspace, which is nice. Um, and we're really proud to support the local economy while we're doing that. I'm a, you know, uh, sort of homegrown kind of kid. And uh, I really enjoy the fact that we can do this uh, out of here and really happy and proud to be able to support the, the, uh, the local economy in the future. So I thought I'd give a little uh, segue into what uh, Martin is going to be talking about. So what's the future? Well, there's a picture I stole. So hopefully Martin's not going to sue me for copyright. Uh, but I think I changed it enough by putting my Horizon Aircraft logo on it. Uh, so that could be the future, clean tech, uh, commons, uh, Peterborough Airport, uh, but really uh, just a very exciting future uh, once we get this airplane up and running. Um, and we're pretty proud, of, uh, proud about that. And what's next? Okay, so like I said, uh, we're going we're gonna to have a subscale prototype flying uh, within a couple of months here, and uh, we'll have some announcements surrounding that. We're going to continue our testing and, and uh, build out our primary technology, which is that wing technology. Um, and make sure that it's doing exactly what it's supposed to do. These activities are often happening in parallel. So while we're doing that, we're actually building a 50% scale prototype as well to prove out some of the aerodynamics and make some tweaks. Uh, and we'll have a really cool full scale cabin mock-up soon uh, with the continuation of that full scale design um, and you know, systems integration, all that sort of good stuff, uh, virtual testing uh, of a lot of the stuff. So a very practical team with deep engineering experience so building airplanes uh, since my father was, I think, 14 years old. Um, and we have members on the team that have designed and built entire new aircraft. And so this is a thing that we can do and we are doing. And uh, we're pretty happy to be able to do it. So uh, I'd like to finish with a little bit of motivation. So it's been a tough year for a lot of folks. Um, but if you look around, some really awesome stuff's happening, right? So we got uh, quantum computers uh, doing computations now with quantum telecommunications. We got Starlink satellites to deliver in high band uh, internet around the world. We got spaceships taking off and landing back on Earth again. Uh, Starship had a little issue the other day, but uh, <laughs> I trust Elon's going to sort it out. This is a really cool time to be born uh, or alive, I should say, uh, and or born for our children, uh, which is great. And uh, at Horizon Aircraft, we're really proud to uh, be part of building that better future for our next generation. So thanks very much, everybody, for uh, taking the time out of your morning to listen to me uh, go on and on. Um, and I really appreciate it. Thanks. Uh, thanks very much, Mike. I'll turn it back over to you. That's great, Brandon. Well, thanks a lot. Just one, uh, we have one quick question, and, uh, and I actually oh, have the answer to it, but I'll let you answer it anyways, of course. Um, just regarding the fact that... Uh, you know, since what happens if the system fails mid-flight, and uh, and obviously you've got some great things with the hybrid that maybe you want to talk about for two seconds. Oh, certainly. Okay, so for the uh, VTOL aircraft, which we're talking about, obviously, uh, mid-flight means the aircraft is operating like a normal aircraft. So the wings are closed, and it's uh, and it's acting like a, a normal aircraft. So if uh, you have a problem with the conventional motor, so the hybrid consists of a conventional gas motor with an electric motor. Uh, attached onto it. If you run out of gas or throw a piston or something, we have a system that automatically decouples the two and the electric system drives the propeller and allows you to make it safely to your uh, next destination, next airport. Um, and, it, and or if you have any power left in the uh, batteries, which you should have it uh, back up to 80% by that point, you can secondarily open the wings up, do a vertical landing in any field that you deem is safe as well. And uh, hopefully you pick one that's uh, maybe close to a bar or something. So you can, uh, you, can <laughs> <laughs> you can, yeah, do, do the fighter pilot thing and just kind of uh, reminisce about what just happened. Brandon, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. You're obviously, it's exciting what you're doing and you're, you know, we're going to see as a huge contributor to our community from, uh, from an innovation point of view. And obviously uh, that building's going to need some serious people to fill it. So we'll be happy to see you uh, fill that building as well. Good job. So thank you very much.
Next, I'm going to introduce uh, Martin Ewell. So Martin is, uh, has built incubators and accelerators actually all over the world. Um, so originally from South Africa, but also built uh, some accelerators out, uh, out west, out east. And of course, we brought him back to our community. He is the former uh, CEO and president of the Innovation Cluster prior to me. And uh, he is now the executive director of the Clean Tech Commons. So I'm going to introduce Martin Ewell. Um, so Martin's just going to drop out here, I think, and just come back in. But uh, just quickly, um, just want to remind everybody that obviously you can continue to follow us on uh, Instagram, Facebook, um, all the different social media channels. Um, we'd love to have uh, anybody who's thinking about opening up a company or starting a company, please come in and apply. If you've got any questions about what it takes to be a startup, we're obviously always available by either email or phone. And um, I used to say you can drop by our office, but uh, we are still running on a on a skeleton crew during uh, during COVID, so we're kind of available from time to time. And now Martin's back. Can we hear you, Martin? How's how's that doing now, Mike? Perfect, Martin. Excellent. Thank you. So I'm gonna. Uh, okay. Sorry for the. You sorry and, for the uh, and thank you very much. Sorry for the slight delay, folks. And uh, you're seeing my screen. Is that right? Oh, we're just seeing you right now, so you just need to share. Okay. Give me one second. There we go. You can see it all. We can. Perfect. All right, Martin, I'll turn things over to you. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks, Mike. And uh, really a great pleasure to be with, with you all this morning, folks. First of all, a huge shout out to my friends at the cluster for uh, hosting this event this morning. And thank you also to PKED for partnering to present this series. But I guess most importantly, much more importantly, thanks to our friends at Chimp Treats for the healthy and delicious start to the day. Apparently, though, I wasn't one of the first 50 to register for this event. Um, I will say what a great treat it is to follow Brandon and his Horizon aircraft story with his significantly larger than life uh, example of clean innovation right here in our own backyard. Brandon, I'm delighted to lend you uh, a building design in exchange for the first Horizon aircraft landing at Clean Tech Commons in the near future. Now, I know that we have a really interesting online mix this morning from clean tech startups to investors to funders, uh, community members, mentors, and even, and even I think a few policy wonks. So I plan to take a few minutes with you today to share a little about clean tech commons for those of you who are not familiar with the project, but also talk a bit about developments in the broader clean tech world. A little about clean tech investing, uh, happy to discuss an emerging model for successful clean tech startups and growth companies, and perhaps share some insights into some of the partnerships that are helping us to be successful in diversifying our economy right here at home. So yes, I am Martin Ewell. I am the Executive Director of Clean Tech Commons, uh, which we are currently developing at Trent University as Canada's only pure play clean technology research and innovation park, which I think you can see behind me on the screen. I will admit, I must say to being a little disappointed that some of you never got the memo about today's dress code, um, but I will, I will push on regardless. Now the slide on the screen in front of you uh, shows the location of Clean Tech Commons, which is marked here in red as the Trent Research and Innovation Park. And I'm sure many of you will recognize that this is on the east bank of Trent University at the north end of the city of, of Peterborough. Now this, this next slide shows the layout of the 85 acres of the park, as well as some of the key design elements that have been included in our master plan, including for instance, that the park will be integrated with the Trent campus, will be designed to foster a, a strong community of innovation, will lead in terms of sustainable design, uh, and will accommodate a range of enterprises and uses. Uh, in, which is obviously really critical in terms of building a vibrant and engaged uh, innovation ecosystem. Now, in helping in particular to address Canada's pretty dismal track record of commercializing the outputs of academic research, research parks uh, have really proven themselves over the years to be pretty significant economic drivers. By creating a place for, for corporations to build corporate innovation centers, uh, through the clustering of innovation activities and through the incubation and acceleration of emerging technology companies, research parks really generate enormous economic impact. By creating dynamic live, work, play and learn environments, they also serve to attract highly skilled science-based 
uh, technology savvy professionals and creatives to a region. So as a research park, Clean Tech Commons is being designed to host a clustered community made up of environmentally friendly and environmentally beneficial growth technology companies, spin out and startup ventures, as well as corporate innovators and uh, innovation outposts, all of which will be co-located alongside the academic and research expertise of Trent University and supported on site by evaluating business support and acceleration services. And obviously our partnership with the innovation cluster is key to many of those activities. I will say that uh, these exciting clean, green and low carbon technology innovators and entrepreneurs are the very folks who aim to create new solutions and, and leverage new deep technologies to profitably solve the world's energy, environment and climate challenges. These will be the innovations that will have both uh, national and global impact. And these are the startups that are going after solving hard technical problems to serious global problems. They're often addressing billion dollar market opportunities and will be the ventures that create tangible, investable technologies. And that's why I couldn't be more, more delighted to follow Brandon, who I think exemplifies so much of this. Now I'm gonna use the term deep tech throughout this presentation uh, to refer specifically to a category of startup companies that develop new product based on scientific discovery. Many of these or most of these originate in university labs and many clean tech, clean tech ventures fall into this uh, category. So deep tech companies then tend to be characterized by a couple of the following features. They generally require lengthy research and development. These are not products that you make in six months, and these are not products that you commercialize in another six months. They may take a long time to reach commercial application or even market ready maturity. And they often, quite often, require significant capital investments to achieve any level of uh, commercial success. However, they do have the potential to address big societal and environmental challenges. And in many cases, they're quite radical. They either create entirely new markets or they serve to disrupt existing ones. And why is this important? Well, recent research out of the UK suggests that between now and 2030, and only if deployed at scale, established digital clean technologies could enable 15% of the global greenhouse gas emission reductions that are required. The International Energy Agency forecasts, I believe, that nearly 35% of emission reductions will come from technologies that are currently only in the prototype or demonstration phase. And that a full 45% of reductions will come from technologies that have not yet been developed or widely deployed. In other words, I think it's uh, fair to say that without uh, this, that net zero goals are simply unachievable without significant technology breakthroughs across multiple classes and multiple industries. And that is why our investment in deep technology research and commercialization is so important. But the good news for early stage ventures in the room today is that global private investment in the deep tech fields has increased by a staggering 20% a year from 2015, reaching, I think, almost $18 billion in 2018, um, with investments in climate tech having grown at almost five times the rate of the overall global venture capital market. Clearly, clean tech investing is no longer niche, and ESG goals are feeding into this trend even more. Since 2013, according to PwC data, funding for climate-related technologies has climbed by a whopping 4,000%. And here's the good news for Brandon, is that of that, mobility and transportation represent 63% of all climate tech funding. And this has been focused in areas like electric vehicles, micro-mobility, and other transit models, 
all of which have been, all of which have been attracting broad investor attention. So Brendan, you're playing in the right sandbox, that's for sure. And this represents a huge improvement after the fallout from the original clean tech boom and bust cycle of a decade ago. Between 2006 and 2011, investors then invested some 25 billion US into clean tech startups and lost more than half of it. At that time, I think it's true to say that far too many startups were still deep in the research and development phase. And in hindsight, we were a pretty poor fit with the venture capital industry, which was counting then on the sorts of higher returns over a three to five year period that they had seen previously in software. Clean tech, common, uh, clean tech companies showed that they require considerably more money and more time to both demonstrate and scale up their technologies. And also while clean tech founders may have been really great at developing technologies, many had little experience building manufacturing capacity and operating real businesses. So many, many lessons have clearly been learned since then. Not only have investors in clean technology adjusted uh, their time horizons, but the current invest, uh, investment cycle is also far more diversified. If you look at Bill Gates's new breakthrough energy venture fund, for example, it's a $1 billion clean tech fund. They are investing today on 20 year cycles and even MIT, um, they run an incubator called The Engine that invests in startups, doesn't count on earning their money back for 12 to 18 year uh, periods. And in addition, while the first uh, boom was primarily about cleaning up the power sector and early efforts to address transportation, venture capital is now investing far more widely, including in these areas, in protein replacement companies like Beyond Meat, um, in startups developing cleaner ways of producing cement and steel like Halifax's Carbon Cure Technologies, uh, to carbon removal and recycling, uh, et cetera. But I think more than that, just as, just as cloud computing and on-demand uh, on service space helped software companies scale, today's sophisticated uh, computer-aided design tools are much more accessible, as are the services for making machined and 3D printed parts, populated circuit boards, and mass manufacturing, resources that previously prevented many startups from getting launched in the first place. And even commercial prototyping tools and today help developers build smart, smartphone compatible and connected devices for both consumers and commercial customers. So what is this new breed of uh, startup doing differently? Well, I think here are some good learning for our local startups for sure. So first, they're emphasizing product over technology, benefits over features. They're learning to communicate how their technology directly solves customer pains or creates customer gains, rather than talking up a range of vanity metrics, such as let's say efficiency and speed. So yeah, while it's true that a two times lower power ratio or two times energy dense battery or, or a 50% more efficient solar cell makes intuitive sense, hitting those goals clearly takes longer and costs more money, making it much more difficult to find the follow on capital later needed to scale. So today, clean tech startups are more successful if they focus on communicating value to customers rather than talking about how they are pushing the technology envelope. Secondly, I think they're building lasting companies. They're not building for quick or early exits. So today's clean tech companies that are raising significant funds are attracting, are also attracting and building talent for the long term. And while that includes engineers, it also includes other functions such as design, product, and marketing. And founders are spending much more time talking about the ways in which their ventures might shape the future and then building internal culture. And that in turn is helping them to attract committed and passionate employees who join the founders in working tirelessly towards achieving a shared vision. And third, they are much, they're increasingly putting customers first and quickly iterating their product development based on customer discovery and feedback. And this is helping them to establish product market fit much earlier in the product development process. And I think a great example of all three of these trends is actually Newfoundland's Verifin, which has just executed, I'm sure some of you have been following, a 3.6 billion with a B dollar exit. Their financial crime management platform 
Uh, it's an innovative anti-money laundering and fraud platform. You know, it's been 17 years in the making. This is a 17 year overnight success story and comes out of an advanced graduate uh, research project at Memorial University <clears throat> in, in Newfoundland. And truth be told, it was only created as a result of a pivot from building robots for the mining industry. What's interesting is the company over those 17 years has built a very unique startup culture, including an internal charity that provides fundraising and volunteer uh, support for local, uh, for local organizations. So from really from three founders to 530 employees, from startup to raising $515 million in equity in 2019, to an almost $4 billion exit in 2020. You know, Verifin offers a completely flexible approach to work with unlimited vacation allowance, parental leave, including for adoptive parents at 75% of salary for a full year. They offer an employee share participation plan. And for most of us in the room, most importantly, they offer free lunch, free healthy snacks and special diet menus. You know, this is a great Canadian success story, especially coming as it does out of a, a relatively inaccessible city of just uh, 114,000 people unconnected to any major metropolitan innovation ecosystem and with a university of 18,000 students. And it also comes out of a place, I guess, where the, the accent is so awful, it makes even me sound pretty good. So uh, thanks, Verifin. But that, ladies and gentlemen, is why I believe an initiative like Clean Tech Commons is so important in our region. By helping companies to commercialize new technologies, by assisting new companies to grow, by attracting new clean tech companies to Peterborough, uh, by creating new economy jobs, by contributing to economic growth and science-based job creation, I believe the clean tech commons can really serve to anchor P uh, Peterborough's emerging clean tech innovation corridor. But the good news is we're not working in isolation. The park is really designed to tap into our region's growing clean tech innovation ecosystem. And we are working collaboratively with partners such as the Innovation Cluster at the early stage of the Venture Formation Pipeline with PCED and others to create what will become, uh, to create what we believe will become uh, Canada's premier location for clean technology research, innovation, commercialization, and entrepreneurship. And clearly all of this is, is critical if we are to successfully diversify the economic base and focus of our region over the long term. If we are to attract knowledge economy job creators, if we are to create high wage science-based jobs of the future, and if we are to retain our best and brightest youth and graduates. Our goal is to uh, attract the companies of tomorrow, the companies that will do all of these amazing and important things. Or maybe to put it slightly differently, to attract innovative companies developing te uh, technological solutions that enable other Canadian companies and consumers to become net zero emitters. So why, are, why the clean tech focus? Well, clearly the issues that Brandon raised in his presentation demonstrate why the world is rapidly changing and why the most advanced countries are all forging cleaner, more innovative economies. For a combination of social, economic, and environmental reasons, this transformation is now inevitable. And Canada needs to act <clears throat> to secure its future position as the world's leading economies reinvent themselves. Clean Tech Commons provides a once in a generation opportunity for our community to capitalize on this economic op uh, opportunity by building on existing regional advantages. And this includes the world-class research uh, infrastructure at Fleming and Trent, which has been doing research in clean tech for, for many, many years. So let's be clear that the global demand for clean innovation is growing. The imperative to address climate change is also creating a lucrative market for low pollution innovation across almost every sector. Accelerating the pace of clean innovation in Canada is therefore not only an important tool for meeting our own climate and environmental goals, but it also represents an important global economic opportunity. And as such, Clean Tech Commons is being designed to provide tenants with the infrastructure, with the facilities, and the services they require to support the growth of globally competitive Canadian clean tech ventures, 
which are able to tap into the global clean technology market, which is expected to be worth as much as what 2.5 trillion in the next two years, or as much as $26 trillion by 2030, creating as many as 65 million jobs globally. Countries that mobilize investment in clean innovation early will be well positioned to capture a share of these massive economic opportunities. And the same is true with regions. Canada clearly already punches well above its weight in the clean tech space, with 12 of the top 100 global clean tech firms being Canadian by origin. Uh, in total, EDC talks about some 850 clean tech companies with revenues of 13 billion, currently employing about 55,000 people. Well, by being at the center of a Peterborough based clean tech cluster, clean tech commons is designed to be the vehicle that will enable this region to take advantage of all of these opportunities and become a hotbed for clean, green and low carbon economy innovation and tech development. And will help Canadian technology leadership um, help build some Canadian technology leadership to solve global energy, environment, and climate challenges. Our Enterprise Centre, for instance, is an accelerator initiative that will provide shared labs, space for technology assessment, demonstration, and piloting, office space, and scale-up facilities specifically designed to support the uh, commercialization of clean tech products and services. And by supporting collaboration between industry and academia, the Accelerator is part of our overall plan to stimulate clean tech sector growth and position this region, region as, a, as an emerging clean tech hub. So folks, I'd like to thank you for this opportunity to share some of these thoughts with you today. Let me leave you with this, that Clean Tech Commons represents a bold vision for the future, advancing our regional economy as a center for clean tech innovation and becoming home to a broad range of organizations and associated programs that serve to incubate, that serve to accelerate, advise, and support new business ventures and entrepreneurial leadership in the clean tech space. I truly appreciate this opportunity to talk to you this morning, and I truly appreciate all of the support that we're getting from so many, and believe that by working collectively and collaboratively, we can indeed make this bold vision a reality for our community. Thank, uh, thank you, Mike, and... Uh, Excellent. That's Thank you very much, Martin. And, uh, your time is perfect right at nine o'clock. Look at that. So once again, on behalf of the Innovation Cluster, I'd just like to thank everybody for joining in. We obviously appreciate uh, everybody that attends these events and uh, also wish to wish everyone a happy holidays. And of course, uh, if you want to laugh and, uh, and see something that's kind of neat every day, make sure you take a look at our advent calendar and uh, definitely make sure you take a look at the one that's on the last uh, day before uh, the Christmas holiday to uh, to see what uh, what the bloopers are. So once again, thank you very much, and uh, and we appreciate it.